Dear, G Dear Jesus, I'm so happy right now. It's minus 30 in Edmonton at the moment, and I get to be sitting here on the beach in Mexico enjoying the sunshine. I know I am blessed. Dear Jesus, I heard some great news today. I got the lead role in the school play. There were at least 20 other girls trying out, but I got it. I know I am blessed. Dear Jesus, I can hardly believe it. I got my test back today, and I got an A. I am blessed. Dear Jesus, it's official. My parents just ran into a lot of money, and they are paying for all my brothers and sisters to be home for Christmas. We are blessed. Dear Jesus, it's minus 30 outside. I didn't get the part in the school play. I barely passed my test. And my parents told me their divorce will be finalized over Christmas, and now we're broke. I am cursed. Congregation, is that true? I think somehow we know that the answer is no. But there is something inside of us that says that that's true. We are very inclined to believe that to be blessed means that we are given good things. I was on Facebook a few weeks ago and I saw a Christian company post a picture that said something like, like this post if you are blessed. And then there were thousands of comments. I'll read you a few. I woke to see another day. I am blessed every day. God is good. If you woke this morning, you are blessed. I have my health. I am blessed with good friends and health. The sun is shining and I can still laugh. He blessed me with one more day. I am thankful and grateful. I did a scan of the comments and those few summarize the main theme. If you are alive, if you are healthy, if you have food on your plate, then you are blessed. Then we can be happy and declare that God is good. So does that mean that if we die, we are not blessed? If we have to go in for a surgery or if we're confined to a bed because of a sickness or a disease, does that mean that we are cursed? If we can't afford to eat a meal, does that mean that God is not good? What would happen if I went up to the chair of council, John Strickweird, about a month ago and chatted with him about his upcoming hip surgery and I said, John, you are blessed. Or when Pastor Rich first learned about his daughter Rachel's brain bleed and was crying his eyes out not knowing if his daughter would live and I came up to him and I said, Pastor Rich, you are blessed. I think if I did those things, we would consider that to be offensive. In addition, I think if I did that and one of you heard about it, you would be angry with me. And you should be, not because what I said is incorrect, but because it is incomplete, which I'll get to later on in the sermon. But I want to point out here that the issue is when we say that we are blessed only when good things come our way, we inevitably communicate that people are not blessed when bad things happen. And then we also end up believing it, and we may believe that we are cursed if bad things happen. Our society as a whole understands what it means to be blessed in a very different way than the church does. Society will listen to popular opinion as truth, but we as a church, we look at scripture for final authority. We read in our text earlier what is actually meant by blessed. When Jesus began his sermon with these beatitudes, people would have been stunned. Jesus does not begin with, blessed are the rich. He never says, blessed are those who are healthy, or blessed are those with loving family dynamics. Or, blessed are you if you're popular and good-looking, which is what people thought and is what people think. Let's look at this again creatively, and let's see if we can be as stunned as the listeners on the Mount of Beatitudes would have been. Dear Jesus, I don't have enough money to buy any food today, and it's a long walk to the homeless shelter. I need you, God. I can't do it alone. I am blessed because the kingdom of heaven is mine. Dear Jesus, I just found out I have cancer, and I'm going to die soon. I can't stop crying. I'm blessed because I'll be comfort comforted. Dear Jesus, everything I have is yours. I'm willing to give up anything and everything. I'd rather suffer than disobey anything you say. I am blessed because I will inherit the earth. 
Dear Jesus, my heart longs for justice. I will pursue justice relentlessly until everything is made right. I am blessed because I will be satisfied. Dear Jesus, today I saw our mean neighbor trying to carry all her groceries into her house at once. So I ran over to help her, and we carried them in together. I know I am blessed because I will receive an abundance of mercy. Dear Jesus, it's Sunday today, and I am so excited to worship you. I want to worship you for who you really are as revealed in the Bible. Not a God that is made up in my head and believe whatever I want to believe because it sounds nice. I am blessed because I will see God. Dear Jesus, it was hard, but I did it. I kindly confronted the person who said hurtful things about me. We had a great conversation, and now we can move forward in a healthy way. I am blessed because I am a child of God. Dear Jesus, I sat at the bus today, and someone I realized said loudly, She's a Christian! And everyone around me gave me a horrible look. And they all got up and sat as far away as possible. I am blessed because the kingdom of heaven is mine. Dear Jesus, everywhere I went today, people were insulting me. They were lying about me. They were talking badly about me. Someone even pushed me to the ground and kicked me. I know it's because I go to church to worship you. I am blessed because great is my reward in heaven. That's pretty different, isn't it? Just leave it. So it's pretty different, isn't it? Does this mean that when we do get good things from God, it isn't a blessing? No, not necessarily. So what does it mean to be blessed? How are we to understand it? Because if we are blessed to be a blessing, which we are, then we need to understand what it means to be blessed. So let's dig a little deeper into our passage and then see what Jesus is trying to say. A little later in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus teaches how to pray, and I'm going to start that prayer, and we're going to see if you can say the next line when I pause. So, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Very good. If you have ever prayed the Lord's Prayer, you have prayed for God's kingdom to come. There is a heavenly kingdom, and there is an earthly kingdom. When sin entered the world, the king of darkness was given rule. And we read in Luke chapter 4 that when Jesus came, he inaugurated the kingdom of God here on earth where Christ is king. When Jesus defeated Satan on the cross and rose again three days later, he established his lordship over the earth. So what we have here is what we live in, the now and the not yet. Because God's kingdom is here, but it's not here completely. Because not everyone in the world lets their knees bow and tongues confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. But we, the church, we do. We confess that Jesus is the Lord and we happily submit to his rule over us. And we wait for the day when Christ will return, which he will, and his kingdom will fully come. Until then, we live in eager anticipation for that. So what does that have to do with being blessed and being a blessing? A lot. What Jesus is doing for us here in the Beatitudes is he's painting a picture of the heavenly kingdom, starting with the first Beatitude and saying it plainly, blessed are you who know how much you need Christ. The kingdom of heaven is yours. Look forward to that. And what fuels our expectancy for Christ's return? Our need for him. I remember being in gems once, and I was maybe in grade six or seven, and we were talking about Christ's return. We had some sort of booklet, and we were answering questions. And one question was, do you want Jesus to return tomorrow? And I remember saying no. I didn't want him to return because I liked my life. I had plans for the future. If Jesus came, then I wouldn't get to go to university, or I wouldn't get to own a house. I'm a bit older now, and I've experienced a lot more pain. I also understand a lot more what's happening around the world, and it's so bleak sometimes. Like last week, we heard about the bombing in Sri Lanka. When we hear in the news about another terrible injustice in the world or something in our life crumbles, we just can't help but cry out, Come, Lord Jesus, Maranatha! Those who suffer the most in this life ache the most for Jesus' return. 
And not suffering in this life can do the opposite. For example, I have a friend who is from the Czech Republic. We used to talk a lot about Jesus and Christianity. She was an atheist and still is, and she lives a great life. She's beautiful. She has a great husband. They had their first child about a year ago. She runs marathons. They're successful in everything. So when I pray for her, I find myself saying, Jesus, have mercy on her. Show her that she needs you. Because right now, why would she ever call upon your name? She has everything, so how can she know she actually has nothing? And we can learn a few things about what it means to be truly blessed in this world. It surely does not mean only material items. In some of my research for this sermon, I learned that the word blessed is in the New Testament 112 times. Does anyone want to guess how many times that word is used for material prosperity? Zero times. The word is typically joined in with words that have to do with bringing us closer to Jesus. The biblical meaning of being blessed is not anything temporary or shallow, but it's a deeply permanent promise of salvation. It is anything that brings us into a right relationship with the God who created us. And that's pretty different with how our world defines that word, isn't it? Jesus pronounces salvation on the Mount of Beatitudes and gives great hope to his people as we wait and wait for our king to return. And all those who belong to the invisible church are blessed. We are a blessed people. Jesus is not saying in the Beatitudes, if you do these things, you will be blessed. He's also not saying, now that you believe in me, this is how you must behave. Jesus is saying to us something like, the beginning of my ministry means the beginning of the heavenly kingdom on earth. I know it's not totally here yet, but it will grow. And when I return again, it will be here fully. And when you realize this, your heart will change. And because of your eager anticipation for the coming kingdom, you'll just want to live into it right now. And these beatitudes, they show us what the future kingdom will look like, but we can still see glimpses of it on earth and we live into it now. And when we live into our identity as being part of the heavenly kingdom on earth, we become a channel of blessing to the world. In other words, we are blessed to be a blessing. Let's look at an example from verse 4, which we looked at earlier in the time of confession. Verse 4 says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. We mourn because we have sinned personally and corporately. We grieve over our sin and are confident that because of Jesus, everything will be made right again and we will be comforted. We mourn in this life for more than that, though. We all have experienced loss in this life. And it's true that in this life that many people who mourn, they will be comforted. But it's also true that many people, even some in this room, will mourn and they will never be fully comforted until the heavenly kingdom fully comes. We live in the now and the not yet. One of my best friends, she lost her dad in the fall of 2017. It was terrible and totally unexpected. And I was talking to her about this, and she said that the people who also lost their dad earlier than expected were the ones who gave her the greatest comfort because they had experienced it themselves and they had really valuable words to say. My friend was telling me that she is now very aware of others who also lose dads too young, and she would seek them out and give them comfort. So we can see how being blessed and be a blessing plays out here in this verse. We are blessed simply because we are part of the heavenly kingdom. We know that this world is temporary. We know that eventually we will be fully comforted, and so we can be a blessing to others who are in mourning. My friend will say, I'm not automatically a blessing just because I experienced this loss. I actually have to seek out people to comfort them. And she does. Congregation, have you mourned? 
You can be a blessing. Who better to comfort someone who just lost their husband than another widow? Have you lost a parent? You can bring the greatest comfort possible to someone else who loses a mom or a dad. When we are in the greatest pain, we receive the greatest comfort from others who have experienced the same pain and understand the same hope. Congregation, we are a blessed people. We just went through a series on Job for Lent, and we also know that we are a suffering people. We are a blessed people, and we are a suffering people. I said earlier that if I were to go to John Strick Weirda or Pastor Rich while they were suffering and told them that they would be blessed, I would be correct, uh, but I would be incomplete. I would need to add a because in there. John and Pastor Rich are blessed because they know Jesus is a Lord over all the earth. But I still wouldn't go up to either of them in the middle of their situation and say, you are blessed because you have salvation. Rather, we as a church, we respond knowing they are blessed people. For example, the day after the the DeLang family heard the news that their daughter Rachel might die, I was in Red Deer for the classes meeting. And I got a call from Gerald Vandermeer because he wanted to see if we could set up a prayer meeting in our church and pray for Pastor Rich, or pray for Rachel. Rich and Patsy, they're part of our blessed church family and they were hurting, so members of our congregation responded by being a blessing. The prayer meeting was held, money was given, emails were sent, videos were made. In whatever capacity we could, our church automatically responded by being a blessing, using the gifts that we have. So congregation, we are blessed because we know Jesus as our Lord right now and in the future. As a blessed people, we are to be an active blessing, not just when we receive material items, but also from our pain. We all have been given gifts to use, all to encourage each other to draw nearer to Jesus. We are a family. We get to do this together. We are in this for the long haul. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus and on eternity and remind ourselves that this life is temporary and the kingdom of heaven belongs to us. And then maybe we'll sound a little something like this. outside. I didn't get the part in the school play. I barely passed my test. And my parents told me the divorce will be finalized over Christmas and now we're broke. But I know I am blessed because you are with me now and you will be with me forever. I know what it feels like and I can bring hope to others who will also go through it in the future. For anyone visiting and does not yet know Jesus, you have heard the hope that we have in Christ. We are not perfect here. We experience our fair share of suffering. We do it. We do not have it all together, but we are together. We follow Jesus who possesses the very qualities that he preaches. He is a supremely merciful one who made peace between us and God and made eternity with God possible for us. And so we invite you to be part of our family. You don't need to go through this life alone. There are people here who have experienced what you are experiencing, and we are happy to be a blessing to you. If you'd like to know more about the gospel, please come find me or Pastor Michael after the service, and we'd be happy to talk with you. If you can't find us, just find anyone in the church, and they will um, will help you get connected. We want you to hear and to know the good news and God's blessing to be upon you, because that is where it all begins, God's blessing. God blessed us first. And every blessing he pours out, we turn into praise. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen.